also, when the contract is somebody sharing the data, one of the, uh, the most rewarding uh, to be able to, to give real world data into the hands of our future practitioners to help them move forward. So does anybody have, has everybody gone to this link that intends to? Can I move forward? Okay, great. By the way, so that's a longhorn. He's not very long yet. That's an immature longhorn. But he's the, the, the mascot of the University of Texas. I think he's, he's kind of cute. His, his predecessor recently deceased, but um, I think eventually his horns will be probably about eight foot wide, which is pretty amazing. But they'll curl at the end so that... So uh, my colleagues and I, a while ago, created the Neuro Bureau. And in the Neuro Bureau, in the creation of that, we codified what we believed uh, should be happening in the neuroscience community. And we believed that data, tools, and ideas should be openly shared. Uh, so we didn't know that that was open science until somebody later said, oh, I, I totally agree with your stance on open science. And, and Daniel Art Margulies and I, who uh, were, were the Neuro Bureau, were kind of like, yeah, yeah, no, that's great. We're into open science, you know. I mean, when we started, it was kind of a... Um, you know, maybe like a social club for, for network researchers, kind of a network of network researchers. Uh, but that's sort of what began my, my, um, my foray into this field. And when you think a little bit hard uh, about it, you know, the goals of open science and what people tend to say about open science is, is that it will accelerate the progress of science. It will make scientific results better through reproducibility and other things. And so I wanted to kind of give you a few things that I think of are key areas where open science can help and neuroscience, both clinical and cognitive. So, it, of course, it democratizes tools, uh, access to tools, data, and uh, education, right, that, that we need for our, for our next generation of researchers. And I think that's one of the most important things we need to do is build up from the base that we have, build up and improve the quality of research that's done in this field through better education. Um, it allows computational researchers access to data so that they can help solve our problems, right? So there's a, there's a, a story that's very common to, to those of you who have computer science background, but uh, back in the early 80s, the, the uh, United Postal Service, the U.S. Post Office, was trying to come up with a way to automatically route their letters. And the way that they came up with it is using, what they wanted to do is use computers to read addresses. But the technology wasn't very good at that time, so what they did in order to improve the technology is they released a, a database of handwritten digits from a lot of different letters, and they, they released the labels, what they should be. And now, or for several years after that, I don't know if it's still true today, that data set ended up being a benchmark data set that was used by everybody that developed uh, prediction algorithms, right? So not only was it great because it spurred all of this research into a new area, but the UPS automatically knew how every new algorithm worked on their problem. Right? Which, so it's kind of a win-win. And hopefully we can build that same type of thing with neuroscience where we get our computational colleagues very interested in these problems. They use our benchmark data sets whenever they write a new paper. And we automatically know in, in the neuroimaging community how well those methods address our problems, which I think is great. Also, it's a great way to amass the resources we need to test our hypotheses. Um, and it's... Um, but, uh, uh, more efficient use of funding resources and government resources, uh, federal resources, tax dollars um, across the board, which is fantastic. So there are a lot of data repositories out there. Here are some uh, of them. Um, so uh, Chris and, and, and Oscar are involved with Open Neuro, which started off as Open fMRI. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But one of the questions that people might think of is, well, why do we need so many different repositories, right? So some of these repositories, so Open Neuro, 1000 Functional Connectomes, ND, NDA, um, uh, Connectome Coordinating Facility, are generic repositories where anybody can upload their data, right? Some of these others, Brain Genomic Superstruct, Ping, um, are specific uh, data sets, right? Specific projects to generate data that just decided to share it on their own, to come up with their own repository. And if you think about it, this leads to kind of an explosion of the number of things out there, and it makes it a little bit more complicated for you, the, the consumer of this data, to be able to find things, right? But the reason I think that it's important that we still have a lot of different repositories is to help share the burden of sharing. 
right? So the amount of uh, you know, storage is, is very expensive, uh, paying for, for the high-speed networking to allow people to efficiently get the data. All of these different things come at extraordinary cost. And the federal government, in of itself, is contributing some money to help out, but it's not taking up the whole slack, right? So what we need to do is, is amortize these, the amount of effort involved and the amount of expenses across a lot of different individuals. So every single one of these has their plus and minuses. They, they specialize in one type of data versus another type of data. But the thing is, is all of these efforts should be applauded. Um, within them, you will notice that some of them, they try to differentiate themselves, which is almost necessary in order to be able to continue their funding, right? You have to be able to explain to your funding why you should fund, you know, my project compared to somebody else's project. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, the goal is, is that all of these things are beneficial. All of them uh, should be rewarded. Um, so I kind of wanted to take you through, and, and I apologize that this is going to be from my perspective a little bit. I, I definitely uh, include a lot of repositories that are otherwise, but these are the stories that I know best, and it's the easiest for me to tell. Um, so uh, maybe we could get other people's perspective um, as well. But So the, the data sharing, the concept of data sharing um, in neuroimaging and repositories for it actually goes back quite a long way. So um, Mike Gazaniga and uh, John Van Horn, or Jack Van Horn, started fMRI DC at Dartmouth uh, quite a while ago. And they had, at that time, uh, Gazaniga was an editor of a journal, and he had a mandate where if you shared the data, or if you published in that journal, you had to share the data through that repository. They were years, they <laughs> were a decade before their time. There was a lot of backlash. its time. That was based on XNAT. It actually had a fairly nice infrastructure uh, for being able to do it, um, and, uh, but the, it, the community wasn't necessarily right for it. So um, the 1,000 functional connectomes, uh, I, I call it sort of the re-beginning of sharing uh, of neuroimaging data. And at this point, it, it kind of hit, I believe, at a time when people were starting to be willing to actually do this. And so they, it kind of, uh, you know, when it came on and the initial papers for that, they, they were sort of a, a special thing. So when this came out, this was 33 sites. Um, it was over, even though it was a 1,000 functional connectomes, there was over 1,200 data sets that were involved in it. And this was started by Barat Biswal and Michael Milham. And Barat Biswal within the resting state community is seen as, you know, a, a leader and one of the, the people that sort of developed the, the area. So a lot of people sort of kind of bought in for this. And, and their goal was to just collect a really large data set so they could look at things like sex differences and aging in these popu uh, uh, in resting state data. And uh, a lot of people donated. And, and, and one reason why they donated is, is they got some big names in there, like Yufeng Zane in Beijing and, um, and Randy Buckner, to, to give very large data sets. And then people were like, well, there's a lot of value here. We, we want to be a part of that. And they started sending it. So this was sort of originally the idea was just to aggregate data from a lot of people so that we could build a bigger data set, right? Because no single individual at that time was able to collect 1,200 data sets, or at least to do it easily. And that's where it began. And then they decided to share the data. And from then, it just kind of skyrocketed. The, we'll talk more about some of the publications related to, to this later. But so the, one of the issues that, was, uh, that uh, was quickly apparent with this data is, is albeit very useful, is, is that it's a bit limited in what you could do with it. All we knew about the individuals was their sex, their handedness, and their age. And we really didn't know much even about the scanning parameters that was used to collect the data. I tried to, uh, a project where I wanted to get all of those parameters together, and it, it failed because, for whatever reason, maybe organizationally, the people didn't really have that data. So uh, Mike kind of went back to the drawing board and he said, well, let's, what we need is a repository where we know more from the data, where there's more interesting problems can be solved. And so from there came the International Neuroimaging Data Sharing uh, Initiative. And this has been very successful. The goal of this is, is to have data with phenotype, right? So there's more than just sex, age, and handedness. There's at least one other measure, be it a, a clinical diagnosis, be it an I, IQ score, something of that nature. We mandated that all the data has to have all the parameters, so that whoever's using the data can have access to all of that information. And so this has been ongoing. So in, in this, we have both 
there's both prospective and retrospective data sharing. Prospective data sharing means that the data is being shared as it's collected, and in many cases, pre-publication. The retrospective data sets tend to be kind of the data sets that have been sort of sitting around, have been used before, and people are, are kind of uh, sharing them after that. So right now, there's about 35 different projects within here. Some of these projects actually have data from many different sites, so it's a bit harder to calculate all the sites that are involved. There's about uh, uh, 10,000, at least 10,000 participants. We now have a, a non-human data set I'll talk more about. And now, it, although it began with ConnectOMS data, it began with resting state fMRI, it's much more broad now. We have quite a bit of different data types. And, and uh, one of the uh, things that, that is very important with Indy and, and may differentiate it a little bit from other things is this idea that the data has to have some sort of assessment along with it, right? Some additional variable that we're interested in. Um, so as a part of Indy, uh, Mike and others began this consortium model. So the consortium model is very similar to what the 1000 functional connectomes is, but it's where a bunch of like-minded researchers compile all of their data together, and each one of those researchers gets the benefit of everybody else's data, but it also builds a data set around a specific theme, right? So again, this is kind of motivating individuals to sort of... Uh, um, access this data, use the problems that people are interested in. So this started with the ADHD 200. There are eight sites that put in data. There's uh, 386 ADHD, 535 typical. And this is primarily resting state fMRI and structural MRI. That was followed on by the ABIDE. There's been two uh, releases of ABIDE, ABIDE 1 and ABIDE 2. And overall, it's up to over 1,088, uh, sorry, that's a typo, uh, autism and um, 1,200 typical. So these, um, when they began, uh, the ADHD 200 began with a, with a competition that encouraged people to try to come up with the best classifier of ADHD, and that spawned a lot of research into using classifiers with neuroimaging data, and the, the ABIDE has kind of to, to brought that on. So these, again, as I said, these, are, these data sets are kind of a distributed model, right? So everybody is giving data that they've already collected. So it is completely, uh, you know, it's different. Right? It they, they wasn't organized from the beginning. The scanning parameters vary quite a bit across site. There's a lot of technical variation that needs to be dealt with. And we'll hear a lot more about how to deal with that in the, in the later talks today. Um, but it begins to ask the question, well, so these things, you know, they kind of highlight some of the issues that we have with our methods, but they're not necessarily optimized for learning more about uh, methods development, right? And so this was followed on by the Consortium for Reproducibility and Reliability. And these are a variety of different test, retest data sets. And the goal is, is that people can use them to look at reliability, reproducibility, those measures, and be able to optimize their methods around those ideas. So there's over 1,629 healthy individuals involved in this. Again, we don't have a lot of information about these individuals. It's more uh, age and sex again, but we have more than one scan on each one of those. So overall, there's about three, over 3,000 MRI scans and over 5,000 resting state scans. Uh, over 1,500 diffusion scans that are associated with this data set. There's a variety of different protocols or, or different um, experiments that were used in here. There was one participant that was scanned 100 times, um, and there are two participants that were scanned five times a day for, for three days. There's one guy that was scanned every hour for 24 hours. These are some very large data sets, and there's some interesting stuff in here. So it'll allow you to test a lot of hypotheses about maybe diurnal variation or, or, or scanner uh, test retest stuff. Um, so that's, that's available. Uh, so um, we, we kind of moved on. You know, the, the, the use of open data in, in human neuroimaging uh, has really helped advance a lot of the methods. And methodologically, in non-human primate and rodent research, methods have, have languished a bit. And there are a lot of hard problems, right? So solving problems for human data doesn't necessarily solve the problem for non-human data. So they just need to be re-evaluated. So uh, recently, there's been a consortium called Primate, uh, or sorry, Prime D, <laughs> which is a primate data exchange where we have uh, 25 international sites that have contributed data from 98 animals. And so structure, functional DTI as well. But now we have a variety of paradigms. So there's anesthetized monkeys. There's awake monkeys. Has anybody here scanned an awake monkey? It's very difficult. The, the, the people who train monkeys to be able to tolerate the scan, they're like, I guess monkey whispers, they're amazing. Um, we also have a lot of movie watching data on these monkeys. And there's movie watching data where they're watching movies that are the same movies that we have human watching data on. So we can look at neural correlates across species, which I think is kind of cool. Um, so uh, 
So open fMRI is, uh, is something that, uh, that hopefully you've all heard about. So this came on maybe just a little bit after um, the 1000 functional connectomes. And it was, whereas the, the uh, FCP was initially focused much more on resting state, this was initially focused much more on task-based data. This is started by Russ Poldrack, the lab uh, where, where Chris works. It's now been um, open neuro, which hopefully... Uh, y'all know more about. So currently there's 122 distinct data sets, over 4,000 individuals, 208 different tasks, but it's much more than task fMRI as well. There's resting state data, there's PET, EEG, MEG, DWI, and they have actually, OpenNeuro has a beautiful interface. Y'all have done very well in terms of being able to access the data and things. I think it's nice. Um, but definitely something that's very interesting. So one of the, one um, a, a data set from there that I'd like to highlight is, is, um, is it okay to say who the individual is? Is that well known, or because on the page it doesn't? Say. Okay, so Russ Poldrack, the, the the PI on the project, scanned himself 107 times, so three times a week for uh, I guess several weeks in order to be able to do it. So this includes T1, T2, DTI, resting state, and a couple of different tasks. Pre-processed variants of this data is available. Pre-processed data. So with Open Neuro, um, it, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but a lot of the data is available pre-processed. Uh, there's blood samples in there. I don't know if the blood sampling data has been processed and released yet, but, but uh, in, in, in several different experiments that he did. So this is a very interesting project uh, that I encourage you all to look at. I think it's, it's a really cool one. Another one, so I have a bit of a clinical bent uh, to neuroimaging. So an, oh, another Another one of the projects that I thought was really exceptional is this uh, consortium for neuropsychiatric phenomics. So this is out of UCLA, and they're they're trying to get sort of a broad understanding of uh, neuropsychiatric disorders. And so uh, here's this this idea of phenomics, where you're sort of studying these individuals from the gene to the syndrome level, all the way up. And so there's quite a bit of information on here. The individuals are well characterized in terms of their phenotype. So they go through, uh, you know, psychiatric screening, diagnostic questionnaires, all of those things to verify that they have a diagnosis or no diagnosis. So there's 130 controls, 50 schizophrenia, 49 bipolar, 43 ADHD. I imagine that this sample is probably still growing. Is that right? Okay, it's completed. But um, so here, so as I mentioned before, this is on Open Neuro, so you can access it uh, either way. Um, so that's a really cool one. But another one uh, that, that, that Chris pointed out that I think is, is uh, kind of really cool, highlights the benefit of both uh, of these data sharing repositories, is data from very important papers uh, that have been released, right? So this is a Jim Haxby's paper. So this pretty much... Um, Defined the methods used on this paper pretty much defined this idea of MV, MVPA and using these types of pattern-based approaches to analyze uh, neuroimaging data. It also started a huge debate over the the, um, the sort of the neuroscience and the, the cognitive processes behind face detection, right? So it's amazing to be able to have access to this original data so you can test your, uh, directly test uh, the replicability of those results using different methods, using the same methods, or test the variation on the hypotheses, right? So you can go to the data and, and, and see if it's there. So, so this, I think, is a really cool example. A really important aspect of data sharing is getting the old data out and available so that we can all reevaluate some of the claims or see how, you know, our own special methodology or uh, hypotheses of, apply to that data. So um, that was a, a, a really good suggestion. Um, so most of the things I talked about before are data sets that weren't necessarily uh, created with the intent to share, but they ended up being shared in sort of this ad hoc aggregated way, right? But on the other end of the spectrum, we have centralized prospective data sharing. So maybe my connect home and, 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 and the other one actually apply to this as well. But the... Um, and so there's, there's a couple of projects like that. And the nice thing about this is there's much, much less technical variation um, in the data, right? So the, the TRs are the same, the parameters are the same, the scanners may be the same or very similar to one another that are used in it. Um, so they're very nice, uh, maybe from the, the, the neuroscience perspective, but if you you know, want to study uh, how, how to deal with heterogeneity in the data, maybe they're, they're not as nice. But, but um, there's some really cool projects here, and I'd, I'd just like to highlight a few. Um, so the Rockland sample is, uh, is a project that I've been involved with um, in New York, and this is a combination of four different ROIs that have um, synchronized their data collection efforts, both their assessment and their uh, neuroimaging data, to build just a really really large repository of, of data. So there's individuals in here from 8 to 85 years old, and rather than having a specific exclusion or inclusion criteria, we just kind of took all comers.
bombers, right? So in, if an individual came in that they could be scanned and they weren't going to kill us, then we would involve them in the study. And so when you have that level of sort of um, variability, you need to be able to characterize it. So we do very deep assessment on the individuals so we know, right? So we may bring in somebody with depression and five other comorbidities, uh, but we assess that and write it down so it's available to you. So we kind of think of this as more sort of studying individuals in the wild, right? A lot of times when we do, uh, you know, uh, clinical neuroimaging studies, we'll take uh, unicorns. We'll take very clean, healthy control individuals and compare them to very clean, you know, maybe depressed individuals who have no comorbidities, right? And whereas that is very smart if you want to maximize the power, hopefully the power, to detect differences, it also may not characterize how people are just every day, right? So if you have one psychiatric disorder, odds are you have more than one psychiatric disorder, right? There's, there's a lot of comorbidities. There are a lot of things that are known to be linked, like anxiety and depression, for example. So hopefully that allows us to get at that. But also one of the goals was just to get as much data as, as we could to, to create a play by a, a, a um, sandbox for, for our colleagues to play in. So we have, you know, we have IQ measures, we have physical measures, we have, uh, we have blood draws, we haven't processed the DNA on that yet, uh, cognitive tasks, neuropsychiatric uh, assessments, just the whole kit and caboodle we kind of threw in on this one. There's not necessarily everything, though, so we didn't evaluate their smelling ability, but... Anyway, hopefully this will be a good place for you to start. So if, y are in, if you are interested in a population that is relatively common in the wild, then there's likely to be enough of those in this data set for you to get a nice chunk of individuals to look at, right? So in terms of the characterization of the individuals, the most common uh, diagnosis is probably some form, is some form of substance, either use or abuse. Uh, and in, uh, secondary to that is uh, depression and our youth. The most common things are ADHD. So it, it fits very well with what we'd expect. So in this data set, we have it started off with 1,000 individuals, kind of from 8 to 85. That was a cross-sectional study. Um, that's mostly been completed. Now we have a child longitudinal where we have 180 young individuals that are being scanned three different times. I think uh, it's uh, every 18 months, excuse me to look at developmental trajectories. We also have an adult longitudinal, which is 40 to 85. Again, they're scanned three times. And that includes a measure, a gold standard measure of cardiovascular fitness. And that's to look at the effects of uh, cardiovascular fitness on cognitive aging. But also, it's, we, you can use it to map aging uh, trajectories, which is nice. Uh, I, I have my study in there is 200 participants, and that's a neurofeedback study looking at uh, modulating the default network. Uh, so that data is in there as well. So at the time, we kind of used the best uh, data collection that we could. So this came out around uh, when the Human Connectome Project was founded. It has the same uh, program officer, so they asked us to use the same protocols that were being developed for the Human Connectome Project. So it has multiband imaging. It has a nice DTI. It, it, it's meant to be a, a bit of a broader sampling in terms of the imaging. So that was a very nice project. And then Mike Millam, who's the, who kind of led this and, and, and some of our colleagues, we decided to create another project, right? And so when you think about neuropsychiatric disorders, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the data. And if you think about what we want to be able to do with neuroimaging when it applies to these, we would like to be able to diagnose. But being able to diagnose, for example, depression isn't necessarily something that we need a machine to be able to do, right? Doctors seem to be doing pretty well with that. But areas that are more important are looking at the difference from maybe somebody with autism and ADHD, right? Are these differential diagnoses when somebody's kind of on the line and, and you need, we want to try to find out more nuanced information to be able to differentiate those. If you look at most of the classifier studies out there, we really can't measure their specificity because we're always just looking at healthy control versus the disorder. We're never looking at healthy control disorder one, disorder two, disorder three. And the reason we don't is we don't have the data to be able to do it. And the goal here is to be able to collect that data. So these individuals are specifically recruited. So these are, our goal is to get 10,000 young people aged 5 to 21 from across the New York metropolitan area. Again, it's cross-sectional. We do like a four-day assessment on these individuals. Uh, we have a, a um, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so again, it's, it's too, too small to read. I encourage you to look at it. And, and we have a very sort of um, a multi uh, modal approach to the imaging. So we have a resting state. We started introducing movies just because they're a lot more tolerable for children and they enable a much broader range of analyses that can be done. Um, so to start that off, we did an evaluation in 13 individuals of the test retest reliability of watching these movies, which is another data set that's available as a part of this. But we also have things like uh, an abdominal scan so we can look 
at visceral fat. We have um, some quantitative MRIs, so we could look at, you know, maybe a myelination or things of that nature. Uh, so this is kind of a, a, a interesting data set from that perspective. Right now, I think it's on the order of about 1,500 individuals. It'll grow to 10,000 over time, um, but that first data set's available. So as I mentioned before, we're specifically, these are children, and it's hard to motivate people to bring their children in to get scanned, and we specifically want to have a lot of disorders. So this data set is what we call enriched for these disorders. So when we advertise for this, we say literally, are you worried that your child is suffering from a mental disorder? Come and we'll help assess that, right? So every, all of these data sets, the, the, the healthy controls are probably just sub-threshold, right? There, there's still some indications that they may have some disorder. So if you're looking for a clean, healthy population, they're, they're, that's going to be much fewer uh, of the individuals in this data set, but there's going to be a lot of, of data sets where they have uh, disorders. Um, and this one, we also have EEG. So again, I'm sorry, it ends up pretty small, but we did a, a, a quite a bit of assessments, including things like uh, sequence learning, eye tracking, resting state, inhibition, uh, naturalistic viewing, a couple of different things with the EEG that's also available in this data. So in these, you have, you know, you have structure, function, and uh, function fMRI, function EEG. So hopefully that, that you know, will kind of help um, more broadly. So everybody's sort of uh, familiar with the Human Connectome Project, or I assume you know, are all familiar with the Human Connectome Project. It's gotten a lot of uh, press. Well, after the, the first Human Connectome Project was done in 1,200 individuals, uh, many of which were twins, but they were all probably about, you know, like 22 to 27 years old. They're a fairly tight age range, fairly uh, small variability, too, when it comes to a lot of demographic factors we may be interested in, socioeconomic class, IQ, things of that nature, education. Um, but that is since, so that was sort of the pilot for a lot of these advanced methods, right? So advanced DTI methods, advanced fMRI methods um, that were developed. But since then, it has been expanded to include lifespan. So there's four uh, cohorts from different age ranges um, that are available now through that project. There's also a variety of disease populations. Populations, Alzheimer's, dementia, epilepsy, anxiety, depression, psychosis. So there's, uh, it, it, it's become much broader. So the, the Connectome Coordinating Facility, uh, it's a humanconnectome.org, is uh, very interesting to this. Uh, one that I didn't include in the slides is a UK biobank, which some of our colleagues here work with, which is a much broader, I think it was a 10,000 overall is the goal? Uh, 100,000 for the MRI assessment. And then it's part of a larger thing where they have other assessments on, what, over a million? Uh, half a million. So it's huge, right? And uh, so that's a very interesting project. Uh, you probably see uh, Carla Miller had a very good uh, paper on that. So it's definitely something I'll encourage you about. And I, I believe it's talked a little bit more about later today as well. Um, so the, the, you know, pro, uh, sharing raw data was sort of the, the, the first step, right? And that was a very uh, important step, something that had to happen. Um, and it helped out a lot of people. But, uh, you know, if you really think about it, if our ultimate goal is to really engage people who are not neuroimaging experts into the analysis of fMRI data to help us learn more about how to do these things, or, or MRI in general, or EEG data, I mean neuro, neuroscience data, then we need to sort of reduce those barriers. And the biggest barrier that exists, particularly for neuroimaging data, is the preprocessing that's applied, right? Anybody here, many of you probably participate in methods research for preprocessing, you know, it's just, it's kind of a mess. There's no clear indications of what's the best way to go. And if you are a, a, a machine learning guy that wants to look at classifiers on this, you don't want to have to wade through all of that and spend essentially enough time getting an additional PhD in uh, neuroimaging in order to be able to do your research. So there's a lot of preprocessed data that are released for that reason. So uh, a project that I was involved with is the process, preprocessed connectome project. Um, but now Open Neuro has a lot of preprocessed data. The Brain genomic superstruct data has um, FreeSurfer that was generated on their data. Ping has FreeSurfer. The Connectome Coordinating Facility has data processed at various levels that, that you can access. So this has become one of the areas. It's a smaller component of the amount of data that's shared, but it's data that's readily avail available. Um, so again, I mentioned with the ADHD 200, uh, that began, they had a classifier competition uh, to do it. And so some colleagues and I in the NeuroBure uh, pre-processed all of the data and released all of those derivatives so that the teams that wanted to participate didn't need to worry about that aspect of it. And the nice thing is, is that the winning team used the, used the pre-processed data, but also this data has been used quite a bit by a variety of people. We followed that on with the abide pre-processing to make that data more accessible. But what we did with this is, is we wanted to make it 
it much more rich for people to evaluate different processing decisions that they may make. So we pre-process the data using um, five different functional pi pipelines, and each one of those pipelines, or I guess four different uh, functional pipelines, and two um, or three of them are structural, so both, right? A lot of function and structural pipelines. And we have some variation in the types of parameters that are used, some of the steps that are used, so people can begin to ask questions like, how would my answer change if I did global signal regression or if I filtered the data, right? So these are important things, but would be substantially difficult to do if you had to reprocess -pre all, you know, 1,000 data sets or so. Um, so Open Neuro is, uh, is what Open fMRI has become, and this has a lot of preprocessed data, but it also is is a, a computational platform that you are free to use as long as you're using data that's shared there or if you're using your own data as long as you're willing to share your data on, on, a, on their timeline, which is a very liberal timeline. I think it's three years now. Um, so, the, uh, so I think this is, again, as I was mentioning before, it's a beautiful uh, 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 interface for it and it uh, allows you to do execute uh, a variety of different pipelines on a variety of different neuroimaging data. And I'll talk a little bit more about, about some of that technology. So um, anyway, most of the data that's available in Open Neuro, I believe, is available at least one preprocessed form. Um, that's probably fair, right? So another thing, um, so we talked about, you know, so the, the Open Neuro data, uh, the data in pre uh, the PCP, those are mostly what I would consider automated pipelines, right? So you preprocess all the data, you find the data that is good, and then you use that data, right? And the data that's not good, maybe you don't spend a lot of time really working with it. And if you think about what you want to do, if you want to be able to fix these things that don't, uh, that, that are um, automated, right? You want to improve automated skull stripping or lesion segmentation. One thing that you need is that, that those expertly applied labels, right? So there's some data sets that have been uh, leaving, and I, I realize this is very myopic. There's a lot of data sets that are out there uh, from various competitions and things. But another concept is sharing data that has already been sort of manually assessed and labeled. And this is great for any sort of classifier research that you might want to do. So to, to uh, an example of this, is Atlas, which are 229 T1 MRI scans. So most of these are collected in the clinics, right? So this is, this is medical data, which is a lot dirtier than a lot of the data that we do with our research. And, and if you look at this, you'll see why. But things like they may be, you know, you'll, you'll have one millimeter in plane resolution and then five millimeter thick slices, for example. So things that, that may not uh, completely work with our quantitative tools, but, you know, this is our target, right? If we want to apply things clinically, these are some of the ty data types we have to deal with. But here, these are manually traced lesions in this data that you could use as sort of uh, training data for whatever you, you're interested in. Or you could directly test your hypotheses about stroke with it as well and not have to do the manual editing. Uh, there's, uh, through my lab, we also uh, released uh, skull strip data uh, where we manually skull stripped and you can use that to help improve your classifier uh, skull stripping techniques. So this is another kind of thing that I think is important to, to look for out there. Um, in addition to these, I would look for things like, like Mackay and other data sets. Uh, there, there's some, some manually editing in there. And so, you know, we're kind of building up. So we had you know, raw data, we had automated preprocessed data, we have manually edited data, and then there's repositories that include the next level, right? So after the data has been published, for example, so neurosynth.org is a way to do meta-analyses, and the approach, so this is Talia Coney, who's a colleague of mine at the University of Texas, but the approach is, is that they uh, analyze, they read papers and try to infer from the paper using a computer, right? So not human-read, but computer-read, um, the, where the locations of the activations are, as well as what contrast those activations go through. And then you can do very large meta-analyses. So this is a meta-analysis of, um, of pain, I believe. Yeah, 420 studies of pain. So currently, they have in their database over 413,000 activations reported from 11,000 different studies, right? So there's another database out there that's called BrainMap, which is a very nice database, but it's hand-curated, right? So people hand-read the papers, and then they transfer that information in there. And people have done comparisons between the meta-analyses you do between Neurosynth and those hand-curated, and you see that there's actually a very nice convergence between those findings. So this is kind of the quick but dirty method, where you're relying on very large numbers in order to kind of handle that noise, and the uh, BrainMap is the other approach where it's very clean data that you put in with the hope that it improves it. 
Um, but so this is a very nice repository that I encourage you to look at just to start developing your hypotheses or testing your hypotheses against what has ever already been published in the literature, right? And so then you can think about, well, rather than reading it from the paper, why don't you just read it directly from the statistical maps that people use to develop it? So Chris developed a, a repository that's called NeuroVault where you can put in your unthresholded uh, statistical maps when you're done with your analysis and, um, and, ha and, and then be able to do many of the same things that you can do with Neurosynth. And actually Neurosynth and this are, are directly connected to one another so you can see sort of how the, your findings relate to other findings in the field. So, so that, that's kind of some of the nice things that, that, that you get out of this. It does very beautiful um, visualizations. So people will upload their data and use it to generate their, their uh, figures, which is very nice. But also it allows you to do reverse inference and other things using the NeuroVault uh, using the data that, um, that is currently in papers and in Neurosynth to, to learn more about what your activations mean, right, which I think is a really kind of compelling idea. Um, and there's also direct support in, is it SPM? There's direct support from, or is there direct support to just put, I know your, your, your beautiful little button thing from a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah, so SPM has a way to directly import your results into to NeuroVault um, as well. But it, it's a nice interface. I think you could do this fairly easily. And so um, if you want to learn more about these things, we talked about you know, the beauty of having all, all, all of these uh, repositories, but the danger is it's just hard to find them. So Nitric is an amazing index of tools and data. So it's, uh, it's essentially, it's been around for a very long time. And it's a, you know, kind of the, the go-to clearinghouse if you're looking for a tool to do something. right? So if I want to get into another area, say Spleen, imaging and I'll learn about how doing spleen co-registration, I can come here and look for tools that have been presented there. So it's a fantastic way to find these things. They have a data repository themselves, the neuroimaging data repository, and they've mirrored a lot of data from other sites, which is another very important aspect so that we don't have a single point of failure to getting access to this data. They have ways of uh, uh, helping you with your cloud computing, um, but also I think their role as an index, the yellow pages for these various things, is really nice. And if you have a tool that is not in indexed on here, I encourage you greatly to do that. That's very useful. Um, so, you know, we've kind of gone through where to look for tools and all these other things. Um, a, a great way to kind of look for information and to, to learn and to meet colleagues who are like-minded using data or, or otherwise is to come to Brain Hack events. So the OHBM hackathon, we just got back from it. And we're, we're all the, uh, the, well, half the speakers were there. That's a bit of contributes to our fatigue. And, uh, but this is a way to interact with other people who are interested in open sharing and uh, to, to learn from them how to use their tools and also to help them develop their tools or get them to help develop your tools. Okay? So this is another area where I'd like to take a brief poll. I would have used some fancy technology if it was available to me. So y'all have heard about all these things. Hopefully y'all are excited about them. What are some things that y'all think are limitations to you using this data or limitations that limit the sort of the impact that you can get with this data. Does anybody have some, some concerns about using this data that they'd like to share? No? Don't be shy. Yeah. So the, uh, the, the ones that I've heard most about are, well, you can't use, so the, they'll say, well, you know, this data is not that exciting, so you can't get a high impact paper with it. Do y'all think that that's likely? The, the impact of your paper? Well, that's great. <laughs> you don't have to worry about the rest of my slides. The, uh, some people are worried about how hard the data is to use, right? That if the, if the data is there, you don't know about how it's collected, it may be kind of a pain, right? So these are some of the things that are constantly used. So uh, an effort led by, by uh, Chris, again, the brain imaging data sharing structure is here to at least to try to, to fix the problem of data organization and trying to create kind of a common language that we can share data in so that you could easily and quickly pull it in, understand it, and effectively use it in your analyses. It, it includes both the folder structure and a naming structure that makes the data machine readable, makes the information from the data machine readable, but at the same time preserves the human readability of the data. And the nice thing, um, and so not only is it a way to share the data, but also it's a great way to organize the data um, on your, for your, your personal data, if you, whether, regardless of whether you want to share it, so that when you have like a postdoc transition or you haven't analyzed the data in five years and want to come back and look at it, you know how it was collected and all that information is there, right? So one of the things you see, it uses the nifty format, which is you know, kind of a, a standard in the field, a de facto standard as well as an intentional standard. One of the draw 
drawbacks about uh, the NIFTY standard is you lose a lot of information from the header about the parameters used to acquire the data. So they replaced that using JSON files, which is another human-readable and machine-readable format that includes all of those parameters. So the nice thing is, is once you preserve all of this information, you could build software that looks at that data and completely configures itself based on the information it pulls in, right? So when you're doing DTI, you don't have to worry about reformatting your, your vector files. When you're doing you know, uh, uh, distortion correction, you don't have to worry about calculating your right echo spacing, all of these things, right, which can be challenging, particularly when you're working for data without that, that um, comes from somebody else, right? So, so Chris and his colleagues have created another idea around this called a bids app. So a bids app is software that's specifically designed to understand the bids format. There are several different pipelines that are created. These are containers which help deal with the distribution and the installation of these. So if you wanted to run and compare, say, for example, CPAC and fMRI prep, you could quickly do that using the same data without having to reformat the data or tell the software anything, right? You tell it your processing parameters, but other than that, any information that it needs to know specifically about the data, it can get from the data, right? So I was a bit uh, prepared uh, in case y'all were thinking about the impact of data, right? So most, a lot of people that I talk about, they'll say, well, you know, the nice thing about data is the sharing is it makes data available, but a problem with it is, is you'll never get a, neuro, uh, a PNAS paper with that, right? Well, in fact, there's been um, several PNAS papers published uh, with it, right? So I wanted to talk a little bit about the impact that data sharing has already made. And this is through the perspective of the indie data, but um, there, there's other, uh, I mean, I, I I don't think that this is exclusively about indie data. I, I think that this information will generalize. So since the 1000 Functional Connectome project, if you look at all the papers that are kind of under this umbrella, it, uh, all the data sets that are on it, it's generated over 913 publications. And that gives you kind of the growth and, and the breakdown for, for the different ones. 1000 Functional Connectomes has by far been the most published, but it's also one that's been around uh, quite a long time. Um, so if you look at publications by field, you'll see that the, the, the majority of the publications do tend to be in neuroscience-centric fields like uh, general neuroscience, neurology, psychiatry, and medicine, right? But beyond those three, everything you know, here down are computer science, mathematics, and those other ways. So there's really getting a broad reach of those things. So not only is it still valuable to the people who are in the community that could generate their own data, putatively, but it's also been valuable in other areas where they don't necessarily have that data. And you can see our breakdown of the publications by types. The vast majority are peer-reviewed uh, journals, followed by preprints, which we presume will eventually become peer-reviewed journals. But we're really proud of the number of theses um, that have come out of this. There's at least 58 that have been out there. That number is a little bit harder to track. So then if you look at kind of, well, what is the impact of these things, right? So um, there's been at least 12 publications in PNAS, which is a very high impact journal. Uh, one of the most sort of um, popular papers or unpopular papers in the last two years is the cluster failure paper by Andrew Eklund, and he used the 1000 functional connectomes data for that. So there's a lot of value in that data, even though that was in that phenotype, and it pointed out some failures in the way that we were doing things. So a really kind of impactful thing that has been accomplished with this data. Um, so the... Uh, what some of the questions that we face when we're uh, under review is, is, well, how much do contributors actually get back from this? Do they just kind of put their data out there and it doesn't really benefit them necessarily? Um, but what we find is, is that in a large case, contributors are actually using their data, combining it with other data from um, the consortium, and actually getting a much larger data set in order to do their analysis on, right? So it's helping them as well. So it, it's useful both to the sharer and the non-sharers alike. Um, so then there's some questions that people say, well, you know, okay, I'll concede now that, uh, that this shared data can have impact, right? So it has had some PNAS papers, but if you had just done any ADH, uh, if you would used data you collected yourself, you probably would have a higher likelihood of having that, right? So we try to do a comparison where we look at uh, sort of a CDF, uh, cumulative distribution function, where we look at the, the citation score of these papers and look at the fraction of it. 
And what we see is, is that there's, very, um, there's a lot of similarity between the distributions of citations for papers on autism that are from the Abide data set and ones that are from the non-Abide data set. If anything, I think um, you do a bit better uh, with the non-shared data. And I think that has to do with the size of the data sets or the fact that you're doing a replication study, which you know, may be perceived as having a little bit higher public uh, thing. And to avoid just sort of a, an overly myopic uh, sort of indie perspective, we also looked at uh, Human Connectome Project and saw that uh, we kind of get a lot of similar results. Uh, it may be a little bit of a bias when you look at the ACP investigators. A lot of the really initial ACP papers had a, a lot of impact, and that may be driving some of that. So um, that's, we got 12 seconds left. <laughs>